It was a critical moment, a crucial moment, you might say, in the life of Jesus and his ministry. It was early, early in his ministry, but he had a choice to make. Luke explains it this way. And this comes from the fifth chapter of Luke, verses 12 through 16. Once when he was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left the man, and then Jesus ordered the man to tell no one. Go, Jesus said, and show yourself to the priest, and as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing, for a testimony to them. But now more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. But he would withdraw to deserted places and pray. And he would withdraw from deserted places and pray. If, you, if we had worship bulletins today, you might read that the title of my message today is Life After Death. Or, what do you do when your favorite model airplane crashes? You might have read it in the announcement and wondered what is this going to be about. So let's talk about what Luke talked about. But let's talk about life and death as well and even expand it a bit. Because you see, I'm convinced that death comes many, many times in our lives. And it comes from many different reasons and sources. It's not just a once and for all, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and you're done. Death comes in so many different ways. Sometimes it comes in the way that, that you've lost an idea, has been taken away from you, a plan, a relationship, a job, a lifestyle, that which you held on to and savored and you loved and it fed you and it made a difference has been taken from you somehow. It's no longer there. That's death. That is the act of us dying to what was. And quite often, quite often we are left with a choice. What now? Life after death. Death comes constantly, it seems like. Now, I have, to, I have to give credit to my sister, my older sister, two years older than me. She introduced me to this concept when I was about 11 years old. Now, this is how it happened. When I was growing up as a kid, I enjoyed making plastic models. Maybe some of you did too. Plastic cars, model planes, boats, trains. And I enjoyed getting in there and, and putting it together. Sometimes very, very sophisticated, if you will, models. Sometimes very simple. Sometimes to be painted. Sometimes to put decals on them. But I had one that was my pride and joy. It was a B-17 airplane called the Flying Fortress. Now, as a kid, I didn't realize the damage that that had done, and it was a war machine. I just thought, this is the coolest model I've ever put together. It had 148 pieces. That was the biggest model I'd ever put together. It had wheels that turned, propellers that turned. It had all sorts of moving parts. Don't tell anybody, but I actually had to look at the instructions a few times. It was a massive project, but I did it. And it was my pride and joy. 
My parents at one point put in some bookshelves in my bedroom. I'm guessing that maybe they were hoping, thinking I might put books on there. No, it didn't happen. That's where I put all my models in full display, my trophy case, if you will. And the centerpiece of that was my B-17, the Flying Fortress. I'd walk into my room and see it, and I'd get a smile on my face. It was that special to me. And so one day I walked into our house, I entered our living room, and there was my sister, two years older. And her right arm cocked like she was going to throw a baseball. But instead, in that hand, yes, was my B-17, the flying fortress. Now, I, I don't want to say that she was angry at me, spiteful. I, I chalk it up that she was very inquisitive. Could a flying fortress really fly? And if it couldn't, would it be indestructible because it was a fortress? Well, we found out. I got there just in time to see her launch my favorite model. And it flew for about two or three feet. And then it flew right into the wall. And it wasn't pretty. It pretty well destroyed it. It didn't survive the crash. Neither could it fly, nor could it survive the crash. And that was my first experience with death. Now, I have to back up and say that I was sheltered as a kid. I was privileged as a child. I had, hadn't lost a dog. Butch was still alive. My parents were alive. My grandparents were alive. My sister, well, she survived. <laughs> no kid in my neighborhood had been shot by drive-by. I didn't have to worry about whether I went to a store and because of the color of my skin or my dialect or language that maybe, maybe somebody would arrest me because I was looking at something. Yeah, I didn't have any of those worries. I was sheltered. I was privileged. And so that was my first experience, as, as trivial as that may seem, that was my first experience with death, of losing something that special. And it cut deep. So I had a choice to make. How am I going to respond to this? And boy, did I respond. I know I yelled, not in a polite manner, not warning my sister to be careful, she might get cut on some of the plastic pieces that were shattered. No, I yelled full scream, I have no doubt. And I don't know that I was coming to blows with her, but that might have been a possibility. My mother intervened, she played referee, she sent me one way and my sister the other way. But that was my choice. That was my choice to get upset and get frustrated and get angry. That was my choice because something special had just been taken away from me. I lost it. There's the easiest way to say it. Jesus had a choice as well because he was facing death. Death to an idea, to a ministry, to his life as he understood it would be. Remember, at this point, even though it's only the fifth chapter in Luke, it's just the beginning, remember, he had already made the commitment that his life was going to be all about loving and healing and teaching the way that God wanted us to. That was going to be his life. He had started this understanding. He had started his practice, if you will. That was what he was doing. But there was a problem. You see, if you understood, and we've talked about this quite a bit, that the atmosphere, the environment in which he was practicing this mission was very dangerous. The Jewish leaders, they didn't appreciate somebody who was going against their laws, going against what they said needed to happen. Jesus would be the one who would break the Sabbath. Jesus would be the one who would go to be the, with the unclean. Jesus would be the one that would constantly break the rules. He knew that was dangerous. 
And the Romans, the Roman authorities, we've talked about that before, that Jesus understood very clearly that if he disturbed the peace, if he decided that he was going to think in a way different than Caesar, he would be in danger. His ministry was going to be wherever people were. But unfortunately, the crowds grew. Unfortunately, his notoriety grew. He was in the limelight. He couldn't go under the radar. So he tells this leper after he's been healed, shh, if you're going to pay tribute, pay tribute to Moses. If you're going to give credit, go give credit to Moses. But don't shh, be quiet about me. He was trying to keep it squelched so he could keep his ministry. But it wasn't working. The crowds continued to come. The crowds continued to raise him up. And he was right in the target zone. So he had a choice. Would this jeopardy take him away from his ministry? Would these dangers take him out of what he knew he was going to do? He had a choice. But you see, his choice wasn't if he was going to maintain his ministry. His choice wasn't if he was going to be consistent with this mission that he had accepted to heal and teach and love. No, he, he was not going to not do that. That's what he would do. That's what he would be. But his choice was how would he do it? How would he be able to navigate those murky waters? How would he be able to remain consistent to what he knew he was going to do? And that's why Luke tells us, and we would hear time and time again that Jesus departed and went to an isolated spot to pray. Now, Jesus wasn't getting away. I think he was getting into a deeper understanding and commitment to what he was going to do. We talk about prayer quite often, don't we? I think sometimes prayer is, is misunderstood. It's not just giving God a list of things to get done for us and say, okay, by the way, by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, I expect all this to be done. That's not prayer. And yet sometimes that seems like that's the way we address when we say the word prayer. But prayer, I think, better defined simply means to breathe. To breathe. To take in that life-giving oxygen, that life-giving spirit that enables us to take that next step. To often be more quiet than loud. To often take in what we are understanding, what we are feeling, and not expect somebody to fix it, but instead, how do I live with this? How do I keep my mission of healing and teaching and loving? Even when I'm hurting, even when I'm in trouble, even when I can't. How do I do that? That's prayer. How do I keep going? Because we are going to keep going. You see, that, that's not only our church, but as individuals. That's what we do. That's what we do. We heal. We teach. We love. That's who we are. Breathe. Maggie Lange is a writer, primarily online periodicals. And she writes a lot about physical health and well-being. And she knows exactly the value of breathing. Breathing the right way, getting that oxygen. She was an athlete as she grew up. She did cross-country and touring bicycle races. Not over the big bumps, but over the long rides, often up steep hills. Maybe you've seen the Tour de France. You've seen these things, and just amazing. Well, this is what she did. And she learned early on the value of breathing that that's not an option. If you are going to maintain your course, it's something you have to do. She learned early on, she was in a race when she was a young girl, just really getting into the system. And she was in a race and they were going up a steep hill. She saw ahead of her, one of her competitors that she was dying to beat. She was close. 
She put everything into it. Her legs were tearing up. Her lungs were burning. Her mind was getting fuzzy. Can I do this? She, her whole body was aching, but she kept pushing and breathing, pushing and breathing. She was in control. She had a rhythm going, and she got up to her, and her, her competitor just leans over says, well, hi, Maggie. I'm, I'm surprised to see you here. How are you doing? Maggie knew she couldn't just keep going. She had to respond. So she decided she was going to enter into a conversation with her friend, her foe, to make it sure that she knew, the other person knew that climbing this hill was no problem for her. She did it all the time in her sleep. So she started talking to her friend about how this is such a glorious day and I'm going to beat you at the finish line and I'm going to do this. And all of a sudden she saw her opponent just leave her. And she realized she had compromised her breathing. She realized she had no control over her breathing. She realized her body was falling apart because she had lost that oxygen that her body had to have. She learned a lesson about how critically important breathing is, especially when you're under stress, especially when you're doubting what the outcome is going to be. You have to breathe. Singers know that. Different athletes know that. Firemen know that. It's something they are trained to do, to breathe, to get that oxygen in. I wonder if that's what Luke really meant to say, and I wonder if that's what happened a lot of times with Jesus. When, when he was under stress, which he was quite often, when he was really needing to re readjust and be ready to keep going on this journey. Now we know sometimes he, like at the temple, when he saw the money changers tables, he went in and just started turning and tossing them all over. So there are times for action, oh, in, indeed. But I, there was also times when Jesus would just back off and breathe. I still thoroughly enjoy Fred Craddock, the Disciples of Christ minister, who gave the illustration about skipping rocks over the river. I've mentioned this before. And sometimes our lives are like those rocks who just skip, 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 just touching the surface. But at some point that rock slows down and it sinks deep, deep into, as we do that, our soul, our spirit, our wholeness. That's what prayer often is. That's what breathing often is. It's stopping and allowing ourselves to go deep enough to remember who we are and why we are here and what we are about. It's been a hard year and a half, hasn't it? But in many ways, it's been a hard decade, a hard century. Life is hard. And we talk about all the social justice, injustice going on, and we talk about our commitment to reach out. But we, sometimes we run out of gas, don't we? Sometimes we just... Our legs are hurting, our lungs are burning, our mind is getting fuzzy because we don't know if we can take that next step. Sometimes we just get worn out. One philosophy is work harder. Good luck with that. The other philosophy might be pray, to breathe, to take that moment to find that breath, that spirit, that soul, which is within each one of us. And take that moment to remember who you are and what you are about. And that's what you are called to be. That is who you are. And take that moment to breathe. Breathe in. Breathe out. Not just an exercise, but as an attitude. Maybe we need to practice that. Because I know many of us, many of you, you're worn out. 
Will we ever get back to life as we think it could be, should be? Will we ever get back to church the way we remember it? Will we ever? I know that's, that's tough. Maybe this is a good time to breathe, just like Jesus did. Will you take that moment and remember that we are committed? We are committed. This is who we are as those who will heal, as those who will teach, as those who will love the way that God has shown us. Breathe. Let's do that as Bill is going to now play that song that remember we've done before, Be Still and Know That I Am God. <laughs> 